adjustments. Ken Griffey Sr. Sometimes you have to get worse before you get better. That's me. Tom Watson. Why are boxing rings square? Why is the foul pole fair? These questions illustrate the contradictory and paradoxical nature of sports. A paradox is defined as a seemingly contradictory statement that may nonetheless be true. After Steve McKinney broke the world downhill ski record, he said, I discovered the middle path of stillness within speed, calmness within fear, and I held it longer and quieter than ever before. Whenever I think about paradoxes, I recall Muhammad Ali's heavyweight title fight against George Foreman in Zaire, Africa. Who would have thought that a boxer could win by inviting his opponent to hit him? The more times, the better. But that's what Ali did. For seven rounds, Ali leaned against the ropes and allowed, encouraged, his powerful young opponent to flail away without, with a barrage of body punches. The rope-a-dope strategy worked. In the eighth round, with Foreman arm weary and exhausted, Ali abandoned his defensive posture and sent George spinning into canvas with a left-right combination. Ali's strategy seems as contradictory as the idea of going over a high jump bar upside down. Dick Fosbury turned his back to the bar before jumping over it at the Olympics in Mexico City. The American won the gold medal and his innovative new technique, which became known as the Fosbury flop, has been used by almost every high jumper since. Sporting is always changing. Sports is always changing. The forward pass changed football forever. The jump shot changed basketball. Metal woods and oxymoron have changed golf and oversized rackets have changed tennis. Just as game changes, athletes must be willing to make changes and adjustments. This isn't always easy. Try this. Fold your arms in front of you. Now unfold them and fold them again. This time, the other way. It feels awkward, doesn't it? It doesn't feel natural. As we talked about earlier, by making a needed adjustment in your game, your performance may suffer temporarily. You have to be willing to get worse before you can get better, which is one of the paradoxes of sports we will discuss. Sports is a game of balance. An example I use is that people who are sick take medicine to get well, but too much medicine can be poisonous, even fatal. In school, kids are taught that if they don't succeed, then try, try again. I tell athletes, yes, try again, don't give up, but maybe try something different. Perhaps do the opposite, a 180 degree turn. Many coaches are rigid and inflexible in their thinking. Everything is black and white, it isn't. Sports can be both black and white, like the oriental yin yang symbol. I try to teach any performer to play in the gray and to understand and accept the paradoxical, paradoxical nature of sports. Let's examine 10 paradoxes. Less can be more. Sometimes the highest form of action is inaction. Athletes require rest and recovery time. Without it, they become stale, burned out, and more susceptible to injuries. In this book, we quote Vince Lombardi saying, the harder you work, the harder it is to surrender. So how can not working as hard as possible be an advantage? One year, the Arizona Cardinals had lost three games in a row. The coaching staff's response was to practice more. You see that with many coaches. They believe that if the team isn't winning, the players aren't working hard enough. So the NFL team worked out on Thanksgiving Day. The players didn't want to be there. Their minds were on family and turkey dinner. The team went through a half-hearted practice, and its star defensive back, Tim McDonald, blew out his knee and missed the remainder of the season. The harder you try to get into the zone, the further away you get. We talked about this in the white moments section. Train hard, but then let the performance flow naturally. Don't try to make something happen. Just trust your stuff and let it happen. Trying easier can be harder. 
Many athletes put too much muscle into their performance in an attempt to create power. Oftentimes, over-muscling is self-defeating. Remember the golfer's prayer, God, grant me the strength to swing easier. Over-control gets you out of control. Or you can gain control by giving up control. When pitchers become too cautious and controlling with their pitches, they often start aiming and steering the ball with unhappy results. Performance improves when they surrender to the process. You often see this one on the golf course too. A weekend player having a miserable round gives up hope. That's when he suddenly sinks the 40 foot putt or hits his longest and straightest drive of the day. Why? He is no longer trying to control his swing. <clears throat> Slowing down can make you faster. Jay Novak learned this paradoxical truth while training with his college track team. Pace instead of race. Be quick but never in a hurry. I once worked with a golfer trying to qualify for the US Open. Instead of arriving in plenty of time before his morning round, he showed up later than he planned. He started rushing and as a result, he didn't play his best. Shortcuts often take you the wrong way. Fear of failure makes failure more likely. Fear creates tension and affects condition. Oops. Fear creates tension and affects coordination and rhythm. The chances of success are diminished. Oftentimes, a team that puts together a winning streak becomes preoccupied with not losing. Once the streak ends and the house of cards falls, players breathe a sigh of relief. Now, they tell themselves and each other, we can start over and concentrate on winning one game at a time. Playing it safe can be dangerous, or the greatest risk sometimes is not to take a risk at all. Figure skater Michelle Kwan played it safe in her final performance at the 1998 Winter Olympics. Tara Lipinski, the underdog, held nothing back and skated a more difficult routine, and then won the gold medal. Kwan later run, won the world championship by going out and letting her performance flow. By playing it safe, athletes are reluctant, reluctant to make the adjustments necessary to move up to the next level of competition. A pitcher with a funky curveball will strike out the size in Class A, but the same pitch will be lunch meat in the big leagues. Improvement requires letting go of old ways. A step backward is a step forward. Sometimes you have to get worse to become better. Tiger Woods stepped back when he retooled his swing. He and his coach, Butch Harmon, believed that in the long run, Tiger Wood would become a more consistent and better player, which he has. The probability of getting the outcome you want increases when you let go of the need of getting it. The more you want to achieve your goal, the more expectations you place upon yourself. Greg Norman wants to win the Masters more than any other tournament. He may want to win too badly, which some theorize is the biggest reason why he hasn't, despite coming very close. Give yourself permission to win, but then let go of the idea of winning and focus on execution and the process. While you must be present to win, you also have to be absent to win. Athletes who experience those white moments lose their conscious mind. They are wrapped in a cocoon. They are living in the moment. <laughs> what is your function? Let's try and finish this. All right. Chapter five, choice, not chance. Consistency is what counts. You have to do the things over and over again. Hank Aaron. The greatest and toughest art in golf is playing badly well. All the greats have been masters at it. Jack Nicklaus. 
Invariably, the question will come after I've lipped out three putts in a row, or as I'm walking off the green, shaking my head with blood pressure pushing the red line after making a double bogey. A member of our group will turn to me and casually ask, So Gary, what do you do for a living? In those self-conscious moments, I hate admitting that I'm a professional sports psychology consultant. I know what he must be thinking. This guy gets paid to help people with their game. If I am playing poorly and the question comes, I'll paste on a smile and say, when you counsel yourself, you have a fool for a client. What fascinates and frustrates me as a golfer is the unpredictability of performance. One day I can shoot 75, which is a good round for me. The next day, playing on the same course and using the same clubs, I may shoot 85. Which player will I be today, Jekyll or Hyde? When he plays badly, Bob, a golfing buddy, laughingly tells me, my evil twin showed up today. Sports psychology is especially prescribed for two kinds of athletes. Some performers will, some perform well in, pay, in practice, but break down in competition because they become self-conscious or over-anxious. Others possess worlds of talent, but can't perform consistently. Consistency separates good athletes from great ones. The best athletes win consistently because they think, act, and practice consistently. <clears throat> Consistency is, def is a defining quality. Whatever your job, Consistency is a hallmark, said Joe Tor, manager of the world champion in New York Yankees. It's much more important than doing something spectacular just once. Do your job consistently, and you'll be considered good. What made Chris Everett a champion? My father's coaching, training, and persistence encouragement paved the way, said the former tennis great. But it was something more. I was consistent over a long period of time because I never looked back, never dwelled on my defeats. I always looked ahead. The greatest athletes are those who can perform at a high level day in and day out, and when they don't feel well or they are off their game. As Jack Nicholas said, it is an art to play badly well. Closing pitcher Dennis Eckersley didn't always have this good stuff. On those days, he performed a little mental trick. You fake it, Eckersley said. You do. You can't you can't let on that you're not throwing well. That's a body language. I really believe it. You still gotta act like you're the man. You can't fake a good fastball. I'm not saying that. But you have to give the impression that your stuff is on time. It's like the television anti perspirant commercial. Never let them see you sweat. Albert Buell says he can sense if a pitcher is confident or feeling a little shaky by the way he carries himself. We reveal much of our thought and emotions through our body language. In a penis cartoon, Charlie Brown is standing with his head bowed, looking at his shoes. This is my depressed stance, he tells Lucy. In the next panel, he draws his shoulders back, chin up. The worst thing you can do is straighten up and hold your head high because then you'll start to feel better. In the last panel, Charlie Brown assumes his woes is his knee pose and says, If you're going to get out any joy, if you're going to get any joy out of being depressed, you've got to stand like this. Joe DiMaggio said, You ought to run the hardest when you feel the worst. Never let the other guy know you're down. Chris Everett boiled inside when she played. If her confidence was shaky, or she was losing her composure, she worked very hard not to show it. If you give in to your emotions after one loss, you're liable to have three or four in a row. Every athlete has bad days. The trick, Arnold Palmer said, is to stay serene inside even when things are going badly outside. Sam Snead believes that to achieve consistency, a golfer must put a distance between himself and what happens on the course. It's not indifference, it's detachment. Jim Colbert echoes Snead's advice. My reaction to anything that happens on the golf course is no reaction, Colbert says. There are no birdies or bogeys, no eagles or double bogeys. There are only numbers. If you can learn that, you can learn to play this game. Ben Crenshaw says that in golf, 
You take the lies as they come. Take the bad bounces with the good. Have you ever hit a terrible drive and then followed it with a mir miraculous recovery shot out of the trees, landing the ball on the green? Don't act surprised when you do something well, and when you're struggling, don't let others know it. Maintain the warrior mentality. Stand tall even if you feel you are coming apart on the inside, and carry yourself in a confident way. All performers can act themselves into a way of thinking, just as they can think themselves into a way of acting. <clears throat> Mental attitude is always important. As a player, Dave Winfield, a member of the 3000 Hits Club, knew, knew that what he thought affected how he felt and how he felt affected how he performed. Jesus. Sometimes, you have to say to yourself that you're going to have fun and feel good before you go out there, Winfield said. Normally, you have fun after you do well, but I wanted to have fun before I did well. And that happened. Damn. Chapter 6. Inner Excellence. The quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field. Vince Lombardi. My baseball career was long. Long initiation into a single secret. At the heart of all things is love. Definitely not going to try and pronounce that name. Early in his career, Shaquille O'Neal and the United States teammates traveled to Athens, Greece to compete in the World University Games. A writer asked the 7 foot 1 center if, during his visit, he had checked out, checked out the Parthenon. No, O'Neal replied, I haven't been to all the clubs yet. Since that time, the world has seen a basketball's man-child mature as an athlete and as a person. Shaq's biggest growth spurt came at age 28 during his 8th pro season when he led the league in scoring, finished 2nd in rebounding, placed 3rd in black shots, blocked shots, and led the Los Angeles Lakers to the league best 67-15 record and the National Basketball Association Championship. During the season, O'Neal thought of a boat trip in Montana he took with his uncle the previous summer. Shaq knew his coach. Phil Jackson had a vacation residence near the river, and during the trip, he found it. In a window overlooking the dock, O'Neal spotted the championship trophies that Jackson's Chicago Bulls team had won. Six gold balls, O'Neal recalled, gleaming in the sunlight. They blinded me. In truth, their sparkle opened his eyes. On the day, he received his own shiny trophy, the 1999-2000 NBA Most Valuable Player Award, the most dominating player in the game said he wanted to be nicknamed Big Aristotle because in his words, it was Aristotle who said, excellence is not a singular act, but a habit. You are what you repeatedly do. Obviously, not everyone who reads this book is going to become a world classic athlete like those quoted in these pages, but each of us can be an MVP, a most valuable person. It doesn't take exceptional talent, education, or wealth to become an MVP. One becomes an MVP by achieving excellence within. Inner excellence is a way of thinking and a way of acting. It is a quality of mind, a mentality that says, no matter how difficult things become, you are responsible and accountable for your thoughts, feelings, and actions. Inner excellence is staying positive in negative situations, and it is dealing with adversity in an optimistic way. It is finding love and joy in what you do and remaining steadfast, steadfastly committed to your goals, values, and dreams. It's staying cool when the heat is on. People with inner excellence look at competition as a challenge. They are motivated by a desire to succeed rather than by a fear of failure. They possess an unconditional, high self-esteem and self-image. They have a can-do attitude and will to prepare to win. They believe the harder they work, the harder it is to surrender. They don't quit or play the blame game, and they look after the smallest detail to go the extra mile. They are big enough to back down from trouble and strong enough to be kind, fair, and honest. Excellence goes beyond winning and losing. Inner excellence can be taken away by a referee or an opponent 
or the final tick of a scoreboard clock. Western society is extremely oriented. We're always going outside of ourselves to find validation in heroes and to measure success. We look outside for what we look outside for what only can be found inside. An MVP works on the inside, knowing that it will show on the outside. Let's review the 10 qualities of inner excellence. The person who is a winner within has a dream. Eleanor Roosevelt said, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Remember, Dwight Smith's sensory rich dream of playing for the Chicago Clubs. Chicago Cubs. Imagination is like life's previews of coming attractions. Pursue your dreams. Turn that dream into action through goal setting. Commitment. MVPs are committed to their goals. They live their lives on purpose. They are Ted Williams as a boy, wishing upon a star and dedicating himself to reaching the sky's the limit goal of someday being known and honored as the best hitter to ever play the game. I hated every minute of training, Muhammad Ali said, but I told myself, don't quit. Suffer now and live the rest of your life as a champion. Joe Frazier, Ali's opponent in three epic bouts, said, you can map out a fight plan or a life plan, but when the actions start, it may not go the way you planned, and you're down to your reflexes, your training. That's where your road work shows. If you cheated on that in the dark of the morning, you're, you're going to find out now, under the bright lights. Responsibility. Those who achieve inner excellence are response-able. They don't let what they can't do interfere with what they can do. Like Nota Begay, they take responsibility for themselves and their actions. There is a footnote to the story about losing my job with the NFL Cardinals. After Buddy Ryan was fired after only two seasons, the organization invited me back. If I hadn't swallowed my anger and disappointment, if I had burned my bridges, they probably w that probably wouldn't have happened. Openness to learning and growing. An MVP turns weakness into strength. Remember, from Mr. Baseball, the Japanese word kaizen, which means constant daily improvement. Learn how to play with the paradoxes of sports. We don't grow old, we get old by not growing. Optimism. A positive mental attitude is essential to becoming the hero that is within you. Chris Chandler could have quit football, but never, but he never lost faith in himself. An optimistic spirit help Andre Agassi climb from the bottom of the world ranking to number one in 1999. I've always learned so much more from my downs than my ups, Agassi said. That is really who I am. Self-confidence. No one can outperform his or her self-image. Athletes with inner excellence like Tiger Woods believe in themselves and their abilities. They know how to do within They know how to do within when they're doing without. Part of responsibility, psychology, is knowing that no one can take away your self-esteem without your permission. Have the courage to grow up and fulfill your potential. Emotional control. In coaching life skills to professional athletes, I am careful not to come off as sounding judgmental rather than make accusations. I pose questions. Do you think that was appropriate? Does thinking like that serve you well? Do you think that was a real mature thing to do? The adversity quotient. An MVP looks at obstacles as opportunities and views setbacks as springboards for outcome for comebacks. MVPs see stumbling blocks as stepping stones. Keep your head up, Paul. Keep your head up, Paul. Bear. Brian advised his college players act like champions. Those with inner excellence possess the backbone of character. They practice good sportsmanship. Success without honor, Joe Paterno says, it is an unseasoned dish. It will satisfy your hunger, but it won't taste good. Former coach Gene Stalling said, you can't go wrong by doing right. While that may sound trite, it's true. Pick people up, don't put them down. Walk your talk, live by your principles. 
If you don't stand for something, you can fall for anything. If you stay in the middle of the road, the chances of getting hit are doubled. An MVP is persistent and patient. Don't give up on your dream. Don't let others dissuade you. Hang out with people who stroke your fire, not soak your fire. When times are good, be grateful. And when times are bad, be graceful. Chapter 7. The Hero Within. <laughs> well, what time is it? Oh, plenty of time. Each time your back is against the wall, there is only one person that can help you, and that's you. It comes from inside. Pat Riley. It's not the size of the man, but the size of the heart that matters. Evander Holyfield. During the 1998 WNBA Finals against Houston, I walked into the Phoenix Mercury locker room before the game. Written on the chalkboard of the clubhouse that would fall one shot short of winning the title was a quotation from Rolf Waldo Emerson. A hero is no braver than the ordinary person. He is just braver for five minutes longer. True. Sports is more than a contest of physical ability. As the ancient Greeks knew, sports also tests courage, which comes from the Latin word meaning heart. And it's the human heart where the hero within us lives. The rich tapestry of sports is woven with the threads of heroes playing from the heart. People overcome adversity, beat the odds, or take their game to a new level. Some stories read like fairy tales. Cinderella stories, we call them. In 1995, Kurt Warner was ba bagging groceries in Iowa for $5.50 an hour. Five years later, he earned the National Football League's Most Valuable Player Award and led his team to victory in the Super Bowl. His bags to riches story is an inspiration as the song I play for athletes at the end of every training session. The song by Mary Carey is titled Hero. Bernard Malamud, author of The Natural, said, Without heroes, the rest of us don't know how far we can go in life. If I can be a source of hope to anybody, Warner said, after being named Super Bowl MVP, I'm proud to be a part of it. Competitive sports can bring out the best in people. Instead of playing small, they overcome their self-doubts and fears. They let their light shine. They find courage, which is the opposite of discourage, and tap into their reservoir of potential. Reflect a moment. Can you remember a time when you were a hero, when you showed heart, courage, and fearlessness that maybe you didn't think you had? I like what Dr. Thod Bell had to say, an assistant dean at the University of South Carolina Medical School. Bell was at one time the world's fastest human over the age of 40. You can rise above almost any obstacle if you're willing to work hard and believe you can do it, he said. I want everyone to remember <clears throat> that ordinary people can do extraordinary things. There is no mold from which heroes are formed. They come in all sizes, all shapes, all ages, and all walks of life. During a discouraging time in my career, I saw a television interview with an Olympic hopeful who had lost a leg in a car accident. After grieving, she had decided to become the best one-legged skier in the world. I didn't feel sorry for her anymore. Jean Disro Driscoll is a six-time Boston Marathon winner in the wheelchair division. In the book, A Hero in Every Heart, Jean describes jogging with President Clinton at his invitation. He told me that I had the best looking arms in America, <laughs> Driscoll said. In fact, when he gave me his autograph, he wrote to Jean, the best looking arms in America. Some people think that successful, some people think that successful persons are born that way. Well, I'm here to tell you that a champion is someone who has fallen off a the horse a dozen times and gone back up the horse a dozen times. Successful people never give up. Most heroes don't make the nightly television news or appear in the sports page. 
The world doesn't hear about the spirit of folks like Elwood Ware, the 70-year-old farmer who fell out of a pecan tree. When his son found him four hours later, Ware was unconscious. He had broken his leg and five ribs. The farmer spent six months on crutches, but neither Mr. Ware's age nor the hit, hitch in his get-along mattered when he picked up a discus at the Texas Senior Games and threw it as far as he could. It didn't matter if I won. The sup, Jesus, sup to Ganarian, good God, that's a big $5 word, said, showing off his silver medal. Thing is, I tried it. Sir Warnk, a retired school teacher, took up running after turning 62. At age 78, the grandmother from Las Cruces, New Mexico, showed up at the Arizona Senior Olympics wearing a pair of sneakers and a cap that spoke of her spirit and good humor. Get even, the word said. Live long enough to be a problem to your kids. <laughs> Sis ran the uh, 440, the 880, and the 1500 meter race. Before Paul Westfall became an NBA coach, he took a job at Southwestern College, a small Bible school in Phoenix. The school didn't have a gym. When Western inter when Westfall interviewed for the position, he asked the president if the school had any players. The president smiled and told Westfall he had passed them in the lobby. I thought that was the tennis team, Westfall recalled. They were all five foot ten white guys. One of them was a substitute named Tim Fultz. Fultz made the team for two reasons. First, Westfall didn't cut a player if he worked hard. And no one practiced harder than Tim. Also, the Tim needed transportation and Fultz at a car. A beat up bomb. Southwestern season came down to a rematch against Arizona College of the Bible. A victory would send the Eagles into the national tournament. Late in the game, two of Westfall's starters fouled out. With 40 seconds left, the coach had no choice but to send in Fultz. As expected, the other team immediately fouled the inexperienced substitute, putting him in at line. Fultz missed both three throws, fouled again. He missed two more. With 10 seconds left and Southwestern's lead cut to three points, guess who got fouled again? Fultz stepped in. Fultz stepped to the line, heart pounding. First shot good, second shot swish. The night the team carried the unlikely hero off the court on its shoulders as players and fans chanted his name. A minister's son, the young man later became a missionary in Zaire. While roofing a new church, he fell 35 feet and later died. That's quite unfortunate. Tim Fultz's heart was transplanted and now beats in the chest of an African man.